as a kid, I would sometimes go out in the backyard at night and just lay back and look at the stars. And、um, in Montana, in the summer, sometimes you can see the Milky Way all the way across the sky. And sometimes I would just lay back and try and feel the Earth rotating under me. Never did.、Um, <laughs> but every time, even though that was so fun and I was so awestruck, part of me was always a little sad. During those times, because I really, at my core, wanted to know about those places, and I know I would never be able to reach any of them in my lifetime. So, flash forward a couple dozen years, and now I am an astrophysicist. I get paid cash money <laughs> to <laughs> to understand things like dark matter and galaxies, and my specialty is supermassive black holes, which is so cool. <laughs> So what I want to tell you about today is the greatest, most profound discovery of our generation. I think of it like when humanity discovered that the world was round. We just did it because we wanted to know about the world in which we lived, and yet that knowledge changed navigation, which changed the way in which we could ship. Goods and ideas and people around the world, and so for better or worse, our world was transformed forever. This is that kind of paradigm-shifting discovery that I want to talk with you about today. Okay. All right. Are you ready? That was it. <laughs> that was humanity's. First detection of a gravitational wave.、And、I just have to confess that when I heard this and saw that wave form, the little wiggle on the bottom, I cried. <laughs> People around me cried.、Uh, there was a fashion designer so inspired by the shape of that wave form that the next day she made a dress. <laughs> so I just have to confess, off script now,、um, that this is. The it dressed among lady astrophysicists. <laughs> <laughs> so when I said that I was giving a TED talk to some of my friends, they were like, "Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool." And I said, I'm, "But I'm going to wear the dress." And I didn't even have to say what dress. And then there were squeals <laughs> so loud <laughs> that somebody came down the hall to check and see that we were not hurt. <laughs> so, <laughs> so clearly, we're a little excited about this event. But、um, as I've been talking, I don't see anybody crying or squealing. So I think I need to do a better job of explaining why this is such a cool, amazing, profound deal. And this is going to require me teaching you a little bit of general relativity. So yay, it's going to be fine. <laughs> it's not painful. You'll make it. It builds character, right? So okay, I'm going to get serious here. The universe itself is three dimensions of space and one of time. That's space-time, and that actually is the universe. And I personally can't see four dimensions very well, and so we always make an analogy of a giant fabric. And so this fabric is space-time, and that is the universe.、Okay, so you can imagine the universe as being this giant sheet. And general relativity says. That matter, like the sun and the Earth, matter bends space-time. So massive objects like the sun, well, they bend space-time a lot, and low-mass objects, lower-mass objects like the Earth, make smaller dimples in space-time, kind of like in that picture. And remember, in that picture, it just looks like space is bending, but remember that's space-time tucked together. So it's really space and time that is stretching. And so, what gravity is at its core is just the response of moving matter to all those dimples in the universe. And in this picture, black holes, which are the thing I work in, are just. Matter that's so compact that they make a very sharp bend in space-time and a very deep bend in space-time. Okay, got that? Next step: matter moves, right? So 
moving matter in the universe makes a moving wave in the universe. Kind of like that picture back there. And so moving matter makes a wave, a gravitational wave. And it's kind of like an electromagnetic wave, in other words, light, in that, oh, it's a wave. Both of them travel at the speed of light, and both of them carry energy. But light moves through the universe and is blocked by things like this room. But gravitational waves are the universe. <laughs> so when you get a wave, it is a wave in space-time itself. We are in space-time, so if a gravitational wave passes us by, we're going along with it. We're waving too, because we are a part of the universe. And I personally think that's super profound. So sometimes I just sit with that idea and imagine that in this room right now, we are bathed with gravitational waves from every bit of moving matter in the universe, stretching and squeezing us, slowing time down for us and speeding it up. I can't feel it. Probably you don't feel it. And the reason why is that this effect is minute, infinitesimal change in space-time for us. Let me just paint that picture, but it's so hard. I kept practicing things that would make sense as an analogy. And the best one I, that I've heard is that, okay, the amount of change in space-time that we usually feel is one part in 10 to the minus 21. That's a big number. And so how to conceptualize that number is super hard. It is less than the size of a proton, which is still hard to conceive. <laughs> what? You don't need to automatically know what? So uh, the best analogy I've heard is that if we look at the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, which is trillions of miles away, when a gravitational wave passes by, it'll move by a hair's breadth. That is so cool. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I was waiting for you all to go, <gasps> but <laughs> pause for a reaction. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I heard a ha ha, sarcastic ha ha over there. That's not nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, where was I? Oh, small gravitational wave. So we need to detect those types of waves. Uh, in space-time itself, and what we would need is a really, really sensitive type of instrument, one of the most sensitive instruments that humanity has ever built. And um, it's called an interferometer. Um, what an interferometer is, is essentially like a light race, a, a race of light. You send a beam of light in one direction, and then in another direction at the same time, and if both of those packets of light have traveled the same distance, they'll come back at a detector at the same time. It's a tie. But if the arm, one of the arms, is shorter, then, uh, then the, the photon will travel much faster along here. Well, actually, it'll, it'll make the distance a lot faster, and it'll reach the detector first. So the photon here will win. And so by calculating that um, who, which photon wins, you can figure out how long these arms are. Okay? And maybe because I didn't paint a good picture, I'll just show you. It looks like this. So you've got a beam of light going around two directions and coming back at the same time. And if either one of the arms change, then you get a pattern on the detector. And did you notice that it, wait, it did this sort of thing? <laughs> so we are, I'm sorry, we are geeks. <laughs> in the best sense. <laughs> so we made a dance. <laughs> Here it goes. Oh, man. This is going to be recorded, right? OK. <laughs> wait, wait for it. Whoop. <laughs> that was the gravitational wave signal right there. <laughs> OK, y'all, let's make history here. I want you all to make a gravitational wave, too. So stand up. Make your interferometer. Do not bonk your neighbor with your horizontal interferometer. That is not nice.
Okay, bless your hearts, you're all doing this, this is great. <laughs> okay, uh, here we go. So I want to do four arm wiggles and then we're gonna chirp. You gotta chirp, <laughs> don't chirp. Okay, here we go. Oh, yay! We just made history, thank you very much. Try the chicken. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, where was I? So this, this instrument is really sensitive. Um, 40 years ago, uh, people made the concept of this interferometer, and for the rest of the 40 years, scientists from all around the globe, thousands of scientists, for 40 years, have been working on trying to make an interferometer that was as precise as needed to detect this tiny, minute change in space-time. And so, um, here's one example. This is LIGO. It's the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. And what it is are the photon rays, an interferometer in Washington with arms that are about four kilometers, and then about 2,000 miles away, there is another same copy of this interferometer in Louisiana. Okay? And this was built, and it's cool, but um, when you turn it on at first, um, re realize that it responds to shaking, and the Earth shakes, it sure does, so, uh, so there had to be uh, an exquisite seismic isolation system to hold the um, hold the arms and the test mass at the very end as still as possible. And so uh, they, the other things about this is that, uh, let's see, air that's in the tube itself can bonk against the mirrors and make a fake gravitational wave signal, so you had to pump all the air out. People walking by, riding their bikes, fake gravitational wave signal. And one time a car crashed into <laughs> what is the interferon that made a fake gravitational wave signal? <laughs> but after 40 years, the sensitivity was finally good enough for us to be able to detect that fraction of a change in the proton length over 44 kilometers. And on September 14th, 2015, there was a little wiggle in the Hanford interferometer and a little wiggle in the one in Louisiana. And actually, the wiggle here started first and then, tr and then seven milliseconds later, there was an, a corresponding wiggle in the other one, which is exactly the light travel time, how much, the, uh, it, how much time it would take the signal to travel from one to another. And it's got a characteristic shape um, small wiggles at first, and then a big giant wiggle, and then stops with a little ring down. And that is absolutely a gravitational wave. So, this discovery helped us show that, gra that, uh, that general relativity is right. It showed that we made basically the most precise experiment and longest lasting precise experiment that I know of. But even cooler, oh yeah, so I gotta play this for you now so you understand the magnificence of it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's so crazy. I still get chills. This is cool, but for me, the, the even better part is what made this. One billion years ago, there was a 30 solar mass black hole and a 40 solar mass black hole, separated by the distance between, let's say, Nashville and Atlanta, orbiting around one another at basically the speed of light, getting closer and closer and closer and crashing into one another. That intense motion really shook the fabric of space-time. It's like I'm shaking my bed, right? The, the sheet on my bed, and it's rippling that gravitational wave out throughout the universe, getting weaker and weaker, until a billion years later, it wiggles a detector, one ten thousandth of a proton length, and another one, again, about that much. <laughs> I didn't do it, it was the black holes. So, uh, um, let's see, where was I gonna go? Oh yeah, so the black hole itself, that discovery was really cool. Um, 
but even the first detection was already a mystery because those black holes are more massive than we had ever thought that they would be. And so um, already that's given uh, astronomers something to chew on. But maybe the more exciting part for me is what it'll do for my research. It's great. It'll help um, me understand how supermassive black holes are born in the early universe and grow and form into the large black holes we see today. That's great. But I think the very best thing is what I don't know it will find, right? That there is something about our universe that we don't know now, and now the universe can tell us. We have a way to detect that. And so there's going to be a paradigm shift soon. I don't know when, and I don't know what, but there's going to be a huge discovery from gravitational waves. It's like this. Every time human beings look at the universe, in a different way, like if we look in a different wavelength of light, or when we look through a microscope for the first time, we discover something very different about our universe. Every time that changes our perspective of the universe. And now we're going to get another change. And I can't wait to find out what it is. So, okay, I'm super geeked out about that kind of thing. But maybe you're not as excited about gravitational waves as me, and I kind of get that. A little. <laughs> but for you, I have something. Remember, you are matter. You move. All throughout your life, you make a gravitational wave. Every move, every choice you make, all throughout your life, is making a gravitational wave, propagating away from you at the speed of light, and long after you're gone, that imprint that you've made in the universe will exist. So for me, the first time that I ever went to an astronomy meeting, I got to dance with Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's written on space time. <laughs> and had I known, had I known the LIGO dance back then, I totally would have done it. <laughs> Later, when I met my husband, that's written on space-time. And when I held my two kids for the first time, that's written on space-time, too. Sorry. So I just want to end with the, the idea that your choices matter. They're going to be part of the universe. And the things that we do now are going to be traveling away from us as a wave in the cosmos at the speed of light, eventually reaching those very stars that I was looking at when I was a little girl. So remember, your choices matter, and they're written in the universe. Thanks.